Hello and welcome to The Vaccine. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. The ABC's disability affairs reporter Naz Campanella joins me on this special program. Naz, welcome. Lovely to be with you. Almost one in five Australians live with disability and yet advocacy agencies say the vaccination rollout has failed people with disability and their families. Now, as it's been a challenging couple of years for people living with disability, hasn't it? It certainly has. Look, it's been two years where people with disability have told me they have largely felt forgotten and left behind. And those sentiments have been echoed in multiple reports that have actually been handed down by the Disability Royal Commission. Now, that held two separate inquiries, one into the pandemic for the disability community and then a separate one on the vaccine rollout. And, Jeremy, we need to remember here that this is already quite an isolated community. You throw the pandemic into that and they're even more isolated. But there were some silver linings as well. It wasn't all bad. Things like working from home, telehealth and also access to online events that were actually accessible for people with disability. Those were some of the things that people have been talking about for years and those were some of the things they actually had access to during the pandemic. Let's bring in Casey Briggs for a look at the data on the vaccine rollout. Casey, it's difficult to paint a precise picture, isn't it? Hi, Jeremy Naz. Yeah, that's, that's right. It's not like there's a national register of people living with a disability in Australia. So we don't have comprehensive figures across the country. But let's look at what we do have, which is figures for people that are participants in the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Let me actually start, though, with the overall national population. 92% of the 16 plus population have had their first dose. 86% of people are fully vaccinated in that population. Uh, and there is a gap between this overall national average coverage and uh, the coverage within the NDIS. About 82%, uh, these figures are about a day old, but about 82% of 16 plus NDIS participants have had their first jab, 76 have had both. So that is a gap of about 10 percentage points. When you look at the states and territories, um, well, the coverage there sort of varies across the country, roughly in line with the variations we've seen in the uh, statewide averages uh, for the full vaccination coverage. But the gap does vary a little bit. It's smallest in Victoria where there's a seven percentage point gap also. It's biggest in the top end where there's about a 16 percentage point gap and in Tasmania that gap's about 14 percentage points. They're the numbers for all NDIS participants over the age of 16 but when you look at the people in the NDIS who are living in disability accommodation of some form, the numbers are actually a few percentage points better but there is still a gap, nationally a gap of about seven percent. Uh, again, smallest in Victoria, biggest in in the NT and Tasmania. And of course, we've seen before, this virus can spread uh, more easily in environments like this when it's given a chance in sort of accommodation uh, of this uh, form. So we want to see these vaccination numbers as high as possible. And Jeremy, Naz, of course, that is the, you know, 400,000 or so people that are participants in the NDIS. But there are, as you say, millions of people in Australia who are living with a disability uh, and we just don't have a good way of knowing what the coverage is for all of those millions of people and if there are any pockets or communities where people might need some more help. Let's bring in Professor Anne Kavanagh, a social epidemiologist at the Melbourne Disability Institute. She's based at the University of Melbourne. Professor, thanks so much for joining us. Lovely to join you both. How is it that people with disability were given a long head start in this vaccination rollout and were still left behind? Well, I think you're completely right. We were prioritised in the vaccine rollout and um, that was fantastic, but there was a complete um, failure in the implementation of that plan. Um, and I think despite advice from the sector that um, there would need to be very tailored solutions to uh, ensuring that people with disabilities were vaccinated, that wasn't implemented. And the Disability Royal Commission found that um, people with disabilities were actually deprioritised um, early on. Um, and I, I think this has been a major problem. There hasn't been tailored communication to the sector. There haven't been solutions um, that are very uh, tailored around the needs of individual people with disabilities, such particular 
particularly disability uh, clinics that are accessible or making sure that various different options are accessible, um, such as in-reach into homes. And I think it's no surprise. Um, it was really interesting to see that data from Casey, the Victoria is actually doing better than most other states. And I, I think that's because very early on they invested in a disability liaison officer scheme where people were actually able to contact someone in the health department and say, these are the issues I have. These are the challenges I have to getting to, you know, my GP or getting to a vaccination hub. How can you help me organise a vaccination? And and they have been tremendously successful in Victoria and the sorts of things that should be happening across Australia. Professor Kavanagh, in the very early stages of the pandemic, I, for one, as someone who was who is blind, had to make some very drastic changes to the way I went about my life. I had to stop for example, getting public transport. That reduced mm. my independence, but I had to do that to stay safe and COVID-free. What are some of the changes that you heard other people with disability making? Yeah, there have been massive changes. People obviously wanted to protect themselves from the uh, virus because many... Um, would be uh, very unwell if they got sick. So um, many people stopped support workers coming into the home, um, which meant they didn't necessarily get the um, assistance um, for daily living that, that they needed. And, and many stopped going into the community and participating in community events or going to other people's houses, even when they weren't restricted from doing so. And I think, I think the reality is that's still happening for many people with disabilities. Some, particularly if they have um, some compromise in their immune system or um, uh, other kinds of problems like respiratory conditions. And um, I think that that's still happening. And so living with COVID for someone with disability is not quite the same as uh, for many other people in Australia. And, and we need to remember we're not, uh, we're not equally in this together. Many people are much more at risk. And early on, you did some research around hesitancy among support workers. Has that now changed? It was, it was, there was a huge amount of hesitancy. Yes, uh, we found about 50% um, of workers were hesitant at that point. Um, um, and, uh, and I think really that has changed. We haven't been able to survey the sector again, but we're seeing rates of vaccination increasing in that workforce, um, despite the fact that a, a relatively large proportion said they would actually leave the workforce um, if uh, vaccination became mandatory, which it now has across all states in Australia. So I think it has reduced, but I still point out that their rates do lag national rates a tiny bit. Um, and given that it's mandatory and they were also... Um, uh, prioritised in the um, uh, phase 1A and 1B of the vaccine rollout, um, that still is not acceptable. We need to be getting them up. Uh, well, we need 100% vaccination. We still don't have that. Um, the mandates don't roll in in the different states for the over the next, for a month or two. Professor Kavanagh, thanks so much for joining us. No problems. Now, Esther Simby is one of the many Australians with disability and has struggled through the pandemic. When I was four years old, I contracted polio and um, the end result of that was my um, left leg is completely weak. I have weaknesses in my lower back and my right leg um, is weak. My right foot is deformed. So it was really a very tough time um, the first few months last year when the lockdown happened and people were panicking and we didn't know what was happening. I was thinking, uh, what if um, I catch the coronavirus? Uh, given I have a disability, what if my in, uh, immunity is low? If something happens to me, what's gonna happen to my children? It was hard to get out of your house to go, even for walk on the streets and with me being stuck in the house with the two little children, it was really hard, but I am now double vaccinated. That's Esther Simby talking about her experience during the pandemic. Disability service providers have been on a very steep curve overcoming the inequities resulting from this pandemic. Andrew Richardson is the CEO of Aruma, one of the country's largest disability service providers. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Jeremy. You were one of the first people in the country to speak out about the inequities in the vaccination rollout. What happened that prompted you to say something? I think right up front, people understood that people with disability are at heightened risk of serious 
illness or death if they contract COVID. And so there was a prioritisation right from phase 1A that said people with disability are important, they need to be vaccinated early. What was incredibly frustrating and unnecessarily put people with disability at risk was that despite the promises, the implementation of phase 1A um, was exceedingly slow for people with disability. For example, if you think back, phase 1A kicked off in late February. Uh, the first person in an Aruma residential home did not get vaccinated under phase 1A until May. It was really shameful. I did a lot of reporting about providers that really had to find their own way because of, in their words, lapses in the rollout of the vaccine. And you've just talked a little bit about it there. Was that your experience as well? Yes, it wasn't. And as I like to emphasise, look, it wasn't for a lack of goodwill or intent on the part of government, on the part of bureaucrats. But ultimately, yeah, you need to back up your promises with action. And for those of us who work closely with people with disability, we sadly were not surprised when it felt as though people with disability were shuffled down the queue. And I think the Disability Royal Commission actually um, did confirm that people with disability were quietly deprioritised by government in phase 1A. And so our call now is very much, look, we've all worked hard, we've come a fair way, let's not make the same mistake a second time round as we go through the booster programs and into next winter and put people with disability at further risk once again. And you did just mention the booster rollout there and that is starting now in residential accommodation or group homes. Can you explain for people that might not understand why are those people particularly vulnerable? Look, there's research from local and particularly around the world that says, for example, people with Down syndrome, if they get COVID-19 are 10 to 12 times more likely to die as a result of contracting COVID. So the risk is very real. And then a lot of people who live in residential disability support settings have very high support needs. They can't just get out and access the community or access a GP. They often need very specialised support in order to be vaccinated. It's, you know, you, you might need sedation, you might need very careful communication and really bring people along on a journey before they're able to consent to vaccination or before they're able to be vaccinated. It, it's a very time consuming but hugely important process. We just need to get it right. How much are things improving uniformly across the country, Andrew? We operate um, in Eastern Australia, so Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT. Uh, look, I'm pleased to report that the vast majority of people with disability living in Aruma um, shared living homes have been fully vaccinated and we've had some early contact with Aspen Medical um, around the booster program and kicking that off. Uh, my plea, though, is let's be proactive Let's not you know, just focus on getting through Christmas and then getting through January. Pandemics aren't going to go away. People with disability absolutely are not going to go away. We need a consistent planned process to make sure that programs like this become a fact of life until the risk is well and truly behind us. Andrew Richardson, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And Naz, as we look to the future, do you have a sense of how many lessons have been learned and whether things are changing for the better? Mm, I think it's safe to say that the things that people are worried about now, particularly with the booster rollout, are those same concerns that people have had with shot one and shot two, for example. It's, it's has there been enough planning? Have people learnt the lessons of, of, you know, the last two years? Are there complex needs going to be taken into consideration. Jeremy, you and I can, for example, turn up to a vaccine hub where there are bright lights, noises and crowds to get our vaccine and wait patiently in a line. Not everyone can do that. So it's really a wait and see mission now. And I'd also say that really, while lockdowns are ending across many states and territories, that doesn't necessarily mean lockdown is over for everybody in the disability community. Naz, it's been really great to have you on the program with me. Thanks so much for joining us. Lovely to be with you. And that is the show for this week. Thanks for your company. From both of us, bye for now.